Son and the Holy Spirit. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. So today we celebrate uh, the commemoration of St. Thomas. Uh, it's called Antipasca. Maybe instead of Pascha. We celebrated Pascha last week and we had bright week all week. And now uh, we remember Thomas. And a lot of people say the unbelieving Thomas. But I would like to say believing Thomas. As we heard in the gospel today that when he thrust, when Jesus asked him to put his fingers into the wounds, his hand into the side, he said, my Lord and my God. And he fell down at the feet of Jesus and worshiped him. So I like to call him believing Thomas because he believed. The Lord said it's more blessed uh, for us who do not see and believe. So think about that a moment. It's more blessed for us who do not see but believe. The priest in the divine liturgy always says, In peace, let us pray unto the Lord. And he says at the end of the divine liturgy, let us depart in peace. So there's that key word, peace. And so I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about some of the dismissal prayer uh, that uh, the priest prays in front of the icon of the Lord as the uh, in, uh, divine liturgy is ending. Now the priest faces the holy icon of Christ and prays aloud the prayer behind the ambon or the pulpit. The ambon and the pulpit is a synonymous name. It is called this because in the ancient church, the ambon was situated in the center of the church, and the priest would stand behind the ambon to say the, this prayer that I will say in a moment. Now the ambon now is uh, situated uh, differently, so the priest now just stands in front of the icon of the Lord, and he prays this prayer, this silent prayer. And if you follow your liturgy books, you know the prayer. O Lord, who blesses those who bless thee, and sanctify those who put their trust in thee, Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Preserve the whole body of thy church and sanctify those who love the beauty of thy temple. Do thou glorify them by the divine power and forsake us not who set our hope in thee. Grant peace to thy world, to the churches, to the priests, to our civil authorities, and to the armed forces everywhere, and to all thy people. For all good, for all good giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from thee, the Father of lights. And to thee we ascribe glory and thanksgiving and worship to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever until our ages of all ages. Now, uh, hopefully uh, you read that in the liturgy book as a priest is praying uh, with, with us. Uh, and the congregation always responds with amen, meaning so be it. But I want to take this prayer and open it up a little bit and to have his focus on what the priest is saying uh, at the icon of the Lord. He says, O Lord, who blesses those who bless thee. Sounds conditional, doesn't it? And sanctifies those who put their trust in thee. Another condition. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Preserve the whole body of thy church and sanctify those who love the beauty of thy temple. Conditional. Do thou glorify them by thy divine power and forsake us not who set our hope on thee. More conditions. And then we go on and we ask for to grant peace to the world, to the church, the priests, civil authorities, armed forces, and so forth. You know the prayer. 
I hope they know their prayer. Now, this is called the dismissal. And some people say, oh boy, the church is done. We can go home now and do what we want to do. Hopefully that's not your attitude. Hope that uh, when you come to the dismissal, you're still focused intently upon which you just participated in the divine liturgy and received of the, of the mysteries of Christ, you know, which is our process of being deified in the Lord, becoming more like Jesus Christ. But in this dismissal, our journey is now coming to an end. Its aim was our reunion with our Lord Jesus Christ through Holy Communion, the Holy Eucharist. This aim now has been fulfilled. We have received the divine mysteries and with them joy, peace, gentleness, love, gladness, calmness, forbearance, faith, hope, goodness, uh, prosperity, and many other gifts. And now we carry these home to our family, to our work, and to our whole life. We are to be the living liturgy. Just because we walk out of that church doesn't mean it's over. We are now to be witnesses of our new life in Christ. We must guard these gifts. We have received them hopefully through humility, prayer, patience, faith, and watchfulness. You know, earlier in the liturgy, the first antiphon, we sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Comes out of Psalms 102 or 103, depending on, on your book. And I'll talk about why there's two numbers. Why is it 102? Why is it 103? But we'll talk about that later. Or do your own study and find out about the Septuagint. And it says, remember, we, we said, Bless the Lord, O my soul. That's our job. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and blessed art thou, O Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. So within me is the center part of our worship to the Holy Trinity. Did not Thomas fall down before God, Jesus Christ, worship my Lord and my God? His heart, was, his heart was divided before that. But now he has unity of heart. He has come before the Lord, the resurrected Christ, and proclaimed him, my Lord and my God. And, the, and Jesus didn't say, no, don't do that. Now the angels say that. Uh, like when John at Patmos was receiving the revelation, an angel came and he bowed down to an angel. And the angel says, don't do that. I'm, I'm an angel sent from God. So we only worship the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His heart, our heart is not to be divided. That is when we say, when we sing that, that song, all that is within me, bless his holy name. You know, the Psalms really are a songbook, aren't they? We sing out of the Psalms. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. We are not to forget all his benefits. We can get so caught up in life that we forget about all of his benefits to us. He forgives all of our iniquities and he heals all our diseases. Do you believe that? You sing it. Do you believe that? Or just do you sing it because everybody else is singing it? Hopefully that you believe what you are saying. Now, what about uh, this thought? Does God love everybody? Well, let's look at that a, long, a moment. When we learn that God loves us, we are free to live life as God meant it to be for us and not the shell or shadow of the life that is offered by the world around us. Remember, that is enmity towards God, the world. The world offers freedom and life apart from God. And by this we can be sure that what is actually offered is slavery and death. Because apart from God, there is no life. Or why would we sing, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death, and upon those in the tomb, bestowing life. 
We're going to sing that for the 40 days now until the ascension of the Lord back into his, uh, his domain, his heaven. It seems like the devil's in charge, isn't it? He is in charge of this realm here. And he said, well, why would God stick us in the middle of this, uh, this realm of Satan being uh, the boss? Doesn't it say to work out thy salvation with fear and trembling? We are here and we're tempted and we can yield or we can fight against it. It's like I, I heard a preacher say one time, it's like a boxing match. Uh, the Lord and the devil are in there in a boxing ring and they're going at it. And uh, you, are the, you are the guy. You, you, are, you, you are the person. And every time you capitulate to sin, the devil puts his hands up and says, I win. But every time you do not yield to that, that sinful thought or that temptation, and the Lord can say, I won, because now my servant sees what's more important, either self-pleasure or serving God. Because it is a fight through, the, through our life to uh, appropriate the will of God and not our own will. Because our own will is uh, messed up. It's, uh, it's hurt. Thank you, Adam and Eve. Of course, we can't say uh, blame them a lot because we've done, the, we've done the same thing probably if we were in the Garden of Eden. So, does God love everybody? Let's find out. John 3, 16 is a pretty familiar verse. And the Lord said to the disciples, God so loved the world. What kind of world? His creation. Not this thing we see here, but His creation, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever believes in Him. Another condition. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So it's uh, not on God, it's on you, isn't it? And it goes on to say in John chapter 3, And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. Who is the light? Jesus Christ is the light. Why do you think we, uh, the, the people that are so blessed to go to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, on that Saturday before that Sunday of Pascha and receive the light when the Holy Spirit comes and lights the candles and all the oil lamps and so forth the light has come into the world and that's just a manifestation of that Jesus came into this world he was the light of the world but it goes on to say men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light. I'm not saying this. Holy Scripture saying this. And because he hates the light, does not come to the light. Why? Lest his deeds be exposed. But he who does what? But he who does what is true comes to the light. That it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. So there's two kinds of deeds. The deeds that you do in darkness by the enemy of, of Christ. Or the deeds you do in the light. To show that those deeds are wrought in God. So we're talking about everlasting life quite a bit. Everybody wants to... Ever, so doesn't everybody in their right mind want to have a life everlasting? Well, that definition is in John 17. And hopefully you know the scriptures I'm going to read. These words that spoke Jesus, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. See the unity and the union between the Holy Trinity. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So you see the, see the working of the Holy Trinity here for our salvation. And he defines it. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, 
the only true God. One God, the only true God. There are many gods on this earth, but there's only one true God. Everybody makes up their own God, it seems. Some people make up Buddha. Some people make up the Hindu God. On it goes. And then even people become their own gods. We call it human secular, secularization. So this is life eternal that we might know, we might know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We had to put Jesus Christ in that formula, didn't we? And that's the wisdom of the Holy Spirit working through John to write this gospel. So it's the only true God that we're seeking, not a false God. The devil wants you to run after a false God and bust hell wide open. But not the love of God the Father. He's, he's given us John, uh, chapter 3, as the uh, God so loved the world, his creation, that he gave his only begotten Son, as it says in Scripture. Now we have to respond to that as I read these scriptures. Either we're going to say yes or no. There's no in between. Either yes or no. If you say no, I don't want it, you don't have to have it. And if you don't want to have it, then you're going to, uh, you're going to bust hell wide open. And you're going to send yourself there and not God. Don't blame God when you end up in a fire, lake of fire. How? We're talking about the only true God. Paul talked about this when he went to the Greeks, didn't he? Because as he was walking up to uh, talk to these people, the, the upper echelon of, of the Greeks, he walked by all these statues to these gods, all these different gods. And then he saw one to the unknown God. He go, hmm, the unknown God. So then he went and preached to them about, you know, unless there's divine revelation, you can't know the true God. He's unknown to you until the Holy Spirit reveals him to us through that divine revelation. Now God has provided us a means to inherit eternal life, but it requires faith and works. Well, I say, well, I have faith. Well, if you have faith, show me your works. You know, look at James, the epistle of St. James. If you have an issue with this, please read that epistle. You say a person that's got, that needs a drink of water and say, Lord bless you. And don't give him a drink of water. What is that? It takes action on our part, not just to believe, because the demons also believe and are fearful. I think sometimes that the demons are more intelligent than, a, than mankind because they don't shudder. They don't, they're not fearful. They're just going through this life willy-nilly. Christ says in, in Matthew 8, 34, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Wow. Take up your cross. We all have a cross. And follow me. So belief, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, Faith in action involves a daily struggle. The cross is a self-denial if one is to attain Christ. He's given us Christ. The Lord is His Son of God here has given us so we might inherit salvation. If we reject what God has provided to us in Christ Jesus, we are truly lost and trying to work it out in our own strength. And I see it all around me. And I'm not bragging on what, I'm working it out. I'm having, you know, every day is a struggle. Every day is a struggle to uh, sanctify my mind that I would think like Jesus Christ would think and not think like the dirt of the earth here. The devil provides us many diversions and excuses to keep us busy from trusting in our Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us we have to do His commandments. He says, Here's some, teach, me to, teach me thy commandments. We say this many times. In Vespers, so forth. Okay, teach me thy commandments, but don't complain. 
Because when you learn the Lord's commandments, you've got to change, don't you? And if we are complaining, we need to self-examine ourselves and say, why are we com complaining about the Lord's commandments? God gave Israel a whole bunch of commandments, didn't He? What was it for? To punish them? To keep them, uh, you know, down and downtrodden and so forth? No, protection. He gave them commandments to protect them for the goodness of their life. God looks on the heart, doesn't He? And that's very clear when we look at David, King David. You know, when the prophet went to Jesse, he had three sons. Two of them are strong, mighty sons. And, and the prophet said, There's, that's not it. Those aren't, those aren't the guys. Do we have another guy? He said, yeah, I got a little shepherd boy out in tending flock. Bring him. And immediately the prophet knew this is the next king of Israel. And he anointed him as king. King Saul was still alive. But he anointed he anointed David to be the next king. Why? Because David was seeking after God's heart. And what, we're, what are we? Are we any better than David? Aren't we supposed to be seeking after God's heart? Well, what is God's heart? Just read the Ten Commandments. We have many commandments, but the, the, the Ten Commandments, the first Three or four tell us the character of God, doesn't it? And then, then it go on and the rest of it are, see those are vertical. And the rest of them are horizontal commandments. How we're supposed to interface with mankind. Look at those Ten Commandments and, and pray about that. See it. We should be like David, seeking after God's heart, shouldn't we? The world will want, not want you to do this. They will make fun of you. If you don't act like the world, they're going to say, you're not part of us, are you? Hmm. So we're going to have to punish you. And they will. They will put everything in your path to not try to impede your desire to seek after God's own heart. I talked about conditions earlier in this message. Let us be diligent you know, about these conditions. Quickly review here. The Lord blesses those who bless thee. You better be blessing the Lord. If you want the Lord's blessing, you better be blessing Him. How do you do that? Doing His commandments. Acting like Jesus. He sanctifies those who put their trust in thee. Are you? Or are you trusting in something else? These are questions that we need to ask ourselves. When you come to church, do you love the beauty of thy temple, or do you make excuses not to even darken the church door and be in the temple of God with the other believers, with other faithful? Well, I don't want to be like those hypocrites. Well, guess what? You're one too. So we'll just join the family of hypocrites. We're working it out one day at a time, slowly, through the process of theosis of becoming like Christ, but it takes time. So I hope you love the beauty of the house of God when you enter into the temple. And we ask, forsake us not who set our hope in thee. We better put our hope in, in, in the only true God because there's no other place to go. Where else you got to go? I, I thought I could go anywhere I wanted to. And then when I came to, came to the, when I was illuminated and came to Christ, and, and then I said, well, there's no other place to go. This is, I'm home. I've, I've trusted in the Lord. I've, uh, I've yielded my will to His will, hopefully, daily. We, we do that. Because if you, if you walk away, which you can do, you can walk away, where, where are you going to go? Back to the world? Back to the, uh, like the dogs? You know? The hogs? You know what they do. I don't have to tell you. So God has given us every opportunity for salvation. Let us be diligent in seeking this because our very life depends on it. You know, you can, if you come now, if you give your heart to Jesus now and follow Him now, it's heaven on earth. You say, how's that? 
You come in the church and you see the beautiful iconography all around us, icons all around us. We know that we are not doing this alone, but there are saints that have gone before us who fought the good fight of faith, and we can do the same. It's not about how many times we fall down. You know, we fall. We sin, we fall. But it's about getting up. If you don't get up, Satan wins. And you have separated yourself from the flock of God, just like that. But if you get up, if Satan's defeated, and the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified, get up. Because the devil's going to whisper in your ear, you've done this so many times, the Lord's not going to forgive you now. And it's a lie from the enemy. Because God says 70 times 7, doesn't he? There's no end to his mercy and forgiveness. The Holy Spirit will lead us if we just let him. Just let him do it. Let him lead us. Don't fight him. Paul fought against it and, and uh, ended up being knocked off a horse. And then he was changed in a miracle manner. You know, the road to Damascus. He even led a, a man, Ananias, to him to uh, pray for him and open his eyes. And then eventually baptized him, and then he went into the desert for three years and had a catechism with the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? The true catechist is our Lord, the teacher. He came back as a mighty preacher. You look at the epistle, and look how many epistles that St. Paul wrote. At first, he wasn't trusted, but he was eventually. He became a major pillar in the church along with uh, St. Peter. So, let the Holy Spirit lead you. As he led Paul, let the Holy Spirit lead you. You're blind until the Holy Spirit removes those blinders and you're illuminated. And you go through the baptismal waters of, and be illuminated and be sealed with the Holy Chrism and receive the Holy Spirit. Then you can say, you can say what St. Thomas said when he saw the resurrected Christ. He says, My Lord and my God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Christ is risen. He is truly risen. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen.